society there is no justice as a city we continue to grow 73 citizen riots come and get us throw out your weapons and prepare to be judged judge this courts adjourned do you wake from your finest fantasy Well, then obviously you're in a world uh, a little different from our own. Welcome to Dystopic Boys. I am Niles. And I am Wendell. <laughs> if you can tell what we look like from our voices, uh, 10 points. 10 points. Rewarded. Let's see. The only picture they've probably seen is the one up on the website. I'm on the right, and Niles is on the left. Si, senor. All right. Yeah, welcome. If you're still listening and you're still surviving out there, um, also 10 points to you. <laughs> it's only worth 10. I hope you ate recently. <laughs> All right, uh, Wendell, why don't you give him a little lowdown here? All right, well, uh, like Niall said, welcome to the Dystopic Radio Network. We are the Dystopic Boys. Um, yep. This is a podcast that uh, Niles and I have been talking about doing for quite a long time. We never really got around to doing it. It was Such something, a long time. Yeah, it was something we always talked about, but never really ended up happening. Um, I'm so excited we're doing this right now. I know, it's finally happening. Um, it was one of those things where uh, the movies are something that both spoke to Niles and I in very different ways, but the dystopic and post-apocalyptic genre was something that we both kind of really resonated with both of us and we felt strongly about so we decided we were finally going to do it um especially after i found out that there were a couple of movies that uh niles had not seen yet and vice versa yeah that's true um so the way this show's typically going to work is we're going to watch a couple of movies and then we're going to do a podcast about them um we're going to talk a little bit about them from the perspective of you know director uh, who's been in them how they fit into the dystopic theme music just different things like that yeah, and um, we got about we got three films uh, that we're going to talk about today. Movies. Um, <laughs> we might have to uh, explain what we're talking about here. Yeah, we probably should go ahead and explain I, that. I automatically call um, well films films because of my history. I actually graduated with a BA in cinema studies and um, comparative literature, and I'm on working on sets as uh, production assistant with films and commercials. So I tend to have learned to call movies films through classes and such but Wendell and I tend to uh, take more of the probably I don't know what you would call it layman's approach to movies where uh, for me it's not so much about did the movie have the right plot did it have character development did it you know all of the things that critics look for in a movie it's a matter of It's a matter of, did I walk out of the movie feeling like I got something out of it? I didn't and say what I wanted it to, by the way. <laughs> Instead of evil. And if I did walk out of the movie getting what I something that I, out of it, then for me it was a good movie. It doesn't matter if it was actually bad or if it was actually good. Well, so if I see a movie and uh, Wendell asks how it was, I either call it a film or a movie, and that pretty much says whether or not he's, he's going to watch it or not. Basically, he calls it a film, and chances are I'm not going to go out of my way to watch it. If he calls it a movie, sure, I'll give it a shot. Movie, Niles right there. Having a movie. A lot of fun with movie. the soundboard right now. So you hear, uh, if you hear you, that noise, you, it's a movie. <laughs> you will have to uh, give us a little bit of slack. Uh, this is the first time we've ever tried doing this. Too so, much fun. Uh, I'm gonna be touching buttons. <laughs> we are new to the podcasting, um, but this is something that I don't know. We we feel like we've got a, a topic that we're passionate about, and we figured we might as well uh, throw it out there and get get you guys involved, and uh, hopefully we can have some good conversation around it. Yep, indeed. Yep, indeed. All right, so one thing that I uh, we think is probably pretty common among uh, you know post-apocalypse and things like that is uh, 
the world's uh, not a good place, right? So you need something to uh, take your mind off of it. So we're going to start each episode with kind of a... Oh, uh, I forgot we were going Yeah, there. we're going to start each episode with a uh, <laughs> what are you drinking segment. Yes, I am drinking a... Uh, <laughs> it's called Hop in the Dark. It's by Schutz Brewery. Brewery. Um, and uh, it's chocolate, dark, and delicious. Wendell? Sounds good. Uh, so what we didn't tell you is where we where we are currently broadcasting from. Uh, oh, yeah, we we both live uh, up in the uh, Seattle Pacific Northwest area, and uh, there's a lot of kind of microbrews and stuff like that. Um, you know, were in, in well, no, let's, they're let's, still surviving. There's exactly there's still a couple you know, of in the post apocalypse world. I mean, moonshine and you know home brewed beer. That's that's the way you go. We're right? drinking found bottles, and uh, there's still breweries that survive. There's you know home homemade of the. Uh, essence so i'm actually drinking it's a local one uh, it's called diamond knot brewing company it's based about 10 miles from here it's an india pale ale that's, they're still uh, surviving nice and hoppy and uh, delicious so yeah that's what we are drinking for today and we're coming to you actually from a uh, open what did you it's it's an amazon warehouse right yeah it's an old amazon warehouse that uh, was abandoned <laughs> uh during the uh I don't know. So you might hear an echo if you speak really loud <laughs> so um should we get to talking about our first right. So this time we did three movies. Um, the first movie is The Postman um, of Kevin Costner fame. Should we uh, talk, s- mention all three movies, or should we just go ahead and start talking about The Postman? Um, let's, let's go with talking about The, uh, the Postman. All right, sounds good. Let's go in so, there. So uh, first we'll do a little bit of a synopsis about the movie. Yeah, just we, so found these, we found these old tapes of yeah. uh, synopsi recording. <laughs> the Postman. Post-apocalyptic America. What begins as a con game becomes one man's quest to rebuild civilization by resuming postal service. Directed by Kevin Costner. Starring Kevin Costner, Will Patton, and Larence Tate. <laughs> uh, oh, those old tapes are hilarious, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> the mystery, The mystery voice behind it all. Um, yeah, so Postman, um, obviously directed by Kevin Costner, um, he also directed Waterworld, um, but he was, unc- Love it. he was uncredited second unit, um, so, uh, and do we really count that? I don't know. But. Well, what's the second unit? Oh, uh, who, you know, a second unit for all these people that don't know is, um, it's another unit separate from the main unit that goes out and... Shoots all like the inserts, um, fly by landscape shots, um, exteriors, um, stuff involving stuntman. They do, they actually do a lot of the stunts most of the time, like oh, okay. big like car explosions. So it's kind of a cool unit to be a part of. So I'm sure he got to do a lot of the um, horse riding. Of course, with I mean, well, this, I'm talking about Waterworld. Not I'm getting mixed yeah, up. Wrong, now. wrong movie. That that's <laughs> that's another show. That's another show. Hopefully we can watch that. But um, we're talking about the Postman. And also, um, Will Patton was in it. Will Patton, um, who did the music? James Newton Howard, one of the best composers out there. At least one of my favorites, anyway. And that's the music you're currently hearing in the background. James Newton Howard also did The Dark Knight. And I Am Legend. I Am Legend. That's a movie I don't want to talk about right now. (laughs) We're going to watch it. It's going to be awesome. Sometime. Um, So, yeah, uh, Wendell, your thoughts? Would you would you like? Well, the one in, the one history? interesting thing about Kevin Costner is uh, he's a really polarizing figure. You know, like certain actors out there, people don't seem to be middle of the road with him. Uh, you either love him or hate him. Well, I'm one of those few that is middle of the road with him. Where it's yeah, kind of true. I don't really have anything against his movies. Um, and actually, the the two mo- major movies that I have seen him in, what I would consider to be major movies, are uh, Waterworld and The Postman. And I actually enjoyed both of them. I I thought that the story uh, especially in the postman, the way that it was told, the the way that the world was pre- portrayed, uh, was re- was really well done. And uh, he plays a really good loner. He plays a really good kind of uh, character that doesn't want to be around society, doesn't want to be around anybody. Uh, it's almost like he's punishing himself for something. I don't know. Yeah, I, yeah, maybe he doesn't like acting with other people very much, so he wants to play these loner parts. That uh, that could be. <laughs> Because they're, yeah, that's true. Because those movies, he definitely has a lot of, uh, he can actually uh, act the uh, part of not liking people. It's true. I mean, look at him in Waterworld, which I keep going back to. I shouldn't go there. 
we're talking about the postman here. And uh, oh, a little neat fact: um, he actually rode, did all of his own horse riding because he's he's into that. By the way, he's into the horses. He's into the horses. Oh, okay. Just, so that whole just checking. that whole shot where. He oh, the uh, the where he where the. With the, the, shot, the, the shot that the turned kid with into the, the uh, statue at the end of the movie, the yeah. kid with the letter. That was probably actually him, though, riding the horse. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like, I like, I mean, this is the reason we're talking about dystopian films is I like this this alternate way of looking about. But I also liked the fact that society has, you know, had gotten to this point to where they're rebuilding this old system, and like it's it's kind of like you're visiting the past again. Like well, how how mail actually started, but it's also it's it's I don't know. Yeah, and it's it's also that I think what it brings to the forefront is that that humankind to to be civilized and to to further ourselves, we rely on communication. We rely on that network of communication with others, and you know, especially just, now. I mean, exactly, especially now, and and that I think is intended to portray a time you know not in the internet age that we're in right now but definitely a time where being able to communicate with loved ones who are hundreds or thousands of miles away even if it is by postal service was definitely something that you you feel remote you feel isolated and you feel like you're not a part of a, a larger whole when you don't have that and and I think this movie does a really good job of showing just what something as simple as a letter can do for making you feel like something greater than yourself. Well, yeah, and it, it, it allows the story to get more broad in the sense of, like, it's not just this little place that they're communicating with. It's, like, all these other places. Like, it, you know, the point in the movie where um, they realize that it is spread. It, you know, the mail system has spread to, you know, other yeah, places. Kind of where he comes, all of a sudden you get this whole like, oh, we're saving the world. Yeah, where where he kind of uh, he comes back to the main postal center and realizes that the the thing he thought he was just doing as a a way to get food had turned into something with you know thirty forty mail carriers and yeah it it definitely it took on a life of its own. Those are always cool. What he had. Those are always cool stories that you you know you see somebody's implanted something and then just it automatically just grows because of how you know. How great of a uh, a rock has been laid in the ground. So one interesting thing about this movie that um, you know we talked a little bit about it off air was uh, Will Patton as the kind of uh, we we you said bad guy isn't the right word maybe his nemesis kind of the 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 yeah I, yeah the I, antagonist of the movie I should say I, I you know I would call it yeah it's definitely more. Um, because he takes, I go to a movie like Unbelievable, um, Unbreakable. Sorry. Oh yeah. Samuel, With, Jackson, uh, Samuel Jackson, Jackson, Bruce Willis. It's it's kind of like people. He he is he is an em, he he is an enemy. He be, he is an enemy. But um, he kind of he takes on like the father figure at the beginning. Like he sees, he sees in Kevin Costner this love of Shakespeare, and this be you know this ability well, to learn and have this kind of knowledge he he took that knowledge and that that uh shakespeare as kind of a sign of intelligence and a sign of civilization right that kind of like book of eli a little bit yeah a little bit like book of eli and and even will Patton's character in that uh the general yeah the general he you know he painted and i love love names like that in movies yeah just Just the general. general you know he he did these things that we traditionally you know in a survival scenario you're not going to paint you're not going to recite sit Shakespeare. So to him, someone who does these things, even in those times, that's a sign of, you know, something greater than themselves. Well, even in, in a survival scenario, I mean, what did he do first? He's like, he's trying to talk Costner into, he's trying to talk, talk the, well, the postman, quote unquote. He doesn't know that at the time. He tries to talk him into joining forces with him because he realizes there's a similar, there's a similar, he sees himself. I mean, I think he yeah. said that in the yeah. movie, right? I see myself in you, yeah. you know, and he, he, you know, he goes about it that way, and then you know, Kevin Costner's like, middle finger, and then yeah, basically, Will Patton's like, Ugh. so w- how do you think this fits into kind of the the theme that that we're doing this for, which is kind of that post apocalyptic dystopian? Because it's it's interesting that we usually think about those movies in terms of explaining what happened, 
explaining why is you know you look at a lot of the movies and tv shows nowadays like the walking dead um things like that where the whole point to it is yes you're ex you're, you're experiencing it through the eyes of these characters but the end goal is to let's figure out why did this disaster happen and let's figure out how we're going to get you life mean the back to normal you mean the characters the characters figuring it out yeah exactly like the characters the the point to the story is the characters figuring out what happened and how to get things back to normal if that's even possible whereas a story like the postman it's it, it, it is that in a very limited sense, but we they only ever tell you in very vague terms what's happening as far as, you know, why is the world the way it is now? Mm -hmm. I, I tend to like stories that allow the character to do that instead of you getting a background story like at the beginning of the movie, like, the world has been thrown into disarray. Yeah, and A disease true. has wiped out half the planet. That's true, but in this we case... We are here. Even the characters themselves, you know, like oftentimes the characters will explain, you know, will tell each other what's going on or something like that for the benefit of the audience. And in this case, like, you really don't get much of that. It's almost like the characters themselves have no idea what's really going on. Or we go, or, or we go to the blind man in the chair. And, uh, let me tell you a story yeah, about exactly. how the world got here, <laughs> young it, apprentice. Exactly, yeah, you, you get that. And you don't get that in this movie. And I, about Samuel L. Jackson. I think that's fine, though. I, I like that um, you see the world for what it is, and it's almost like by not addressing it, there's no going back. By not addressing the, the what happened to bring the world to where it is, it's like they're not saying, hey, this is going to be a quick, easy fix. It's like, this is how the world is, and you got to deal with it. Well, yeah, and, and you know, a lot of the characters don't know exactly how it happened either because it's been so long or... Whatever, so I, I'd rather be in their position than necessarily know what's going on. And they're like, duh, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you see the intro to this movie? That's true. Don't you know what's true. going on? Kind of that, that fourth wall, so to speak, where, yeah. where the audience, uh, what do they call that in uh, storytelling, where the audience knows more than what the characters do? Um, there's a, I know there's a term for that. Uh, I have no idea. What foreshadows the easy way out of it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> God, what's the term? I should know this. I went to film school. Well, not really, but <laughs> I went to literature school, probably. Um, oh, side note, Will Patton, he loves green tea. Yeah, so hot, I, I hear that you met hot him. Hot green tea. So I uh, met him. Uh, there was a local film. Uh, well, spoiler, I don't know if I'm supposed to announce. I won't say the name of the film. Film or movie? He was... I would say a film. Ah, it'd crap. be it'd be a film <laughs> of the w sort of going back in time. It's it's uh it's kind of it's kind of done in a looking at history, but it's it's actually based on a novel. Um, I won't mention the film, but uh, he was he was in town for a local film. I was on the set, production assistant, uh, taking care of actors, and yeah, he loved his green tea. And so he, no, like he, bowls of green M and M's turned right side up. No, or, but green, you know. green necessarily. Green but, tea's but it not was really green. green. But anyway, oh, okay. Yeah, he needed his green tea, and he'd always lose his gla reading glasses and his script, and he'd always want his little short director's chair, not one of those tall ones, but one of those short ones. He always requested one of those. Maybe he had like he liked being low to the leg syndrome. ground. I don't know, but he's a he's a he's a weird character weird, i mean weird you, you see you see the characters he plays in movies or at least when he's playing bad guys or generals he, he's kind of kind of like that in real he's life he's kind of off the wall a little bit a little, little off the wall yeah. a little brisk it's kind of he can be scary sometimes too it's like <laughs> what is he thinking right now <laughs> you probably don't want to know what yeah, he's thinking right this, now in his old age he's yeah anyway <laughs> he's a cool guy nonetheless all right um I think to kind of wrap it up, we'll talk a little bit about the soundtrack. So the soundtrack was by. Do you want to, do you want to leave that to the end? Do you want to do that? Uh, yeah, I guess we can leave that till the end. We'll, we'll leave we'll that to the, the end. In our soundtrack, soundtrack segment. Too bad we don't have Indeed. a. Yeah, we don't have a bumper for that one yet. Yeah. Um, as you can see, well, they we'll, call them bumpers. Well, that's what they're like. called. They're called bumpers. <laughs> they're called bumpers. It's it's podcasting speak. Uh, yeah. I've listened to a lot of them. I've never done one, so I know what it's called. That's true. You have listened to more of these than I have. So too many. Um, all right, so the second movie we did this time, uh, to completely switch things around, uh, we'll let it get introduced by uh, our uh, the old school cassette tapes again. Yeah. <laughs> Judge Dredd. In a dystopian future, Dredd, the most famous judge, 
A cop with instant field judiciary powers is convicted for a crime he did not commit while his murderous counterpart escapes. Directed by Danny Cannon. Starring Sylvester Stallone, Armand DeSante, and Rob Schneider. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, it's so, We're having a lot of fun with this, if you can't tell. so great. <laughs> oh, mystery synopsi reader. Is that his synopsi? Synopsises? Synopsis. That's, that's like plural, isn't it? Synopsises. I don't have any idea. What's the word? Tell me now, people. Yeah, yeah. Well, you'll find out later how you can uh, send us some feedback. So we'd welcome you <laughs> like telling how to say us synopsi. how to say synopsi, <laughs> synopsis, whatever that word is. Correct our brainless minds, please. Wait, is this a zombie apocalypse that we've survived? Oh, it could be. Because yeah, yeah. then in that case, it would be good to be brainless because then they wouldn't. Okay, anyway. That's getting off topic. All right. Um, so <laughs> or <ju> is it? <laughs> All right, so Judge Dredd. Um, this is that's right. We're talking about Judge Dredd right now. This is probably the f one of the movies that sparked this podcast because uh, I I probably watched this about eight or ten years ago um, and found out just in the last year or two that you had never seen it. Yeah, I mean th this is this is the film that sort of well movie. this is <laughs> this is movie. This is the movie. This that, is definitely uh, a movie that actually Wendell wanted to watch first. As I recall, because this one and post you had a little, well. you had a little um, passionate love for this film. Is that correct? I sure. <laughs> Just wanted to say, betray the law. So yeah, Judge Dredd is one of those interesting movies that's it. It takes a future that none of us hope comes to pass, but it takes kind of the the approach of how is humanity going to deal with this type of a scenario. Your background music. Um, <laughs> oh, so uh, sorry, not to not to interrupt you, but maybe we should uh, talk about uh, who's, yeah, yeah, who's involved who, who, in this. Who's involved before in this? we get too started. Um, directed by Danny Cannon. Who's that? Danny Cannon is I don't know some guy. That okay, to glad we direct. cleared that up. All right. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what else. If he's only we, if only we still lived in a world where there was this thing that we could go to. You mean call to Wikipedia that, that I'm looking at right or, now, or like an or um, an, I, the I'm Imdb. Uh, I am D something. I am D. No, he's he's done some BBC stuff. Uh, he's he's more films. <laughs> well, you know BBC. I don't know if you call it more films. I guess, but uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to find out what else he's what else he's done. I guess I could I am D. Him, but I'm on Wikipedia right now. Well, so okay. So I'm while you're doing that, so anyway, he's um. So let's see, Sylvester Stallone, Diane Lane, um. Younger Diane Lane, of course. Rob Schneider, um, <laughs> believe it or not. I mean, there's all that. Choice. Um, and Armand Asante plays Rico. Um, I kind of like him. I, I, I thought he to, did a really good job. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember uh, like oh, what else I've way, seen him in recently. Um, prior warning to anybody who's listening: this will be spoiler filled. Where our opinion is that any movies <laughs> that are uh, you know ten to twenty done years in the old, '90s, if you haven't seen them, uh, then spoilers are okay. <laughs> I think spoilers only last oh, work. I think spoilers are only important like for films that haven't come out yet. Yeah, or even like a maybe like a one, or like in one, recent month. Yeah, like month or two limitation <laughs> statute of limitations, one or two months. Yeah. Where's our background music? Where'd it go? It's gone. I'm trying to pull up our oh jeez, Wikipedia just like shrunk on me. Like cold water in a swimming day. <laughs> I don't know. So anyway, um, Wendell, just go go on talking about why you love this film. <laughs> All right, so yeah, it's it takes this approach at a future for humanity where, you know, the the Earth has become scorched and people can only survive uh, in these these mega cities, right? And it. I love the mega cities. When, yeah, I know exactly. And you throw all of these people into one city, and it it takes a it takes a method of law enforcement that we're not used to thinking about in terms of these days you know right now the way our society exists judge jury and executioner are three very different people or very different not even just one person but very different groups of people and to get anything through it takes sometimes years or decades to get certain punishments passed and actually completed whereas this portrays a society where you know one person is judge, jury, and executioner, and they have full authority of the law to go out, 
make a judgment and carry out the punishment. Yeah, you have Sylvester Stallone embodying yeah. the whole judicial system, basically. He's like, you die because you broke the law. Your punishment is death. Well, and, and I think that's an interesting, you know, we talked about it earlier that, that Rob Schneider is almost the opposite of that character, right? Yeah, they throw in the polar opposites to, you know, be able to compare, like, I mean, to really see the contrast between Sylvester Stallone, who's all about the law and, like, brick wall in front of his face. Um, well, and it's almost like in order to be able to see how strict um, Dread is, you need that kind of opposite end where that, that uh, character who survives at all costs. You know, uh, Rob Schneider's character in there, he, what, he gets a five-year sentence to, because he broke into a food droid to avoid getting killed by uh, two rival gangs shooting at each other. You know, and, and for yet, tampering with city property, yeah, basically. tampering with city property, and yet yeah, Dread sentenced him to five years because there, there's no extenuating circumstances in this society, or so we think at the very beginning. It's whatever you do wrong, there is a punishment, and there, there's no excuses for why. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think Dread even said uh, when when Rob Schneider said, you know, I had to I had to do this or I would have died. He said, then you should have died. So it, that's the approach that they take is, look, there's, no, the law. there's yeah. no excuse for breaking the law. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I I totally, I mean, I th- one, one thing I, I dealt with was, I I, don't th- I felt like dread. I mean, you, you know, while the film progresses, you start to see this kind of shell break um, him. And I don't, from the very get-go, I think I, I wanted more, I don't know. I th- I thought Dread was very. I don't know. I, I I didn't I didn't like believe in Dread at the very beginning of the film, which is why I think I don't I don't think I was rewarded at the end because I didn't see this huge. I mean, it didn't have to be huge transformation, but now was he? I, I'm going blank. He was actually. I mean, he was a regular person, right? Yeah, I mean, he, well, there, was, there no. wasn't. Was there a cl- no, super was, soldier involved? Yeah, I mean, was, yeah. Remember, he, him, and Rico were products yeah. of that. Uh, what I, I'm drawing a blank now on what the name of the uh, the I want to say it's the Lazarus Project or something like that, but I don't think that's what it was. It was something like that where looking, him looking. and Rico were the product of this basically genetic manipulation project to create on a much faster time scale these uh, soldiers that would be. You know, the ultimate judges, so to speak. And they canceled the project because one of them, Rico, his brother, went crazy. And, you know, so I think that I think that uh, at the beginning of it, we're meant to see Dread as this very cold and the the true embodiment of the law. But I think that that's true because, I mean, he is a clone sort of that that. (laughs) The Rob Schneider character then comes in, and while it seems ridiculous, he's basically the Jar Jar Binks of Judge Dredd, um, right? I mean, he's ridiculous, and it seemingly serves no purpose, but I think in this movie he does. I think in this movie he he gives you, he gives Judge Dredd a reason to start to break through that shell. Because when Dredd gets wrongfully accused uh, halfway through the movie, you know, Dread has to come to terms with the fact that the law can be wrong. The law can have holes in it where there are th- there are circumstances that the law is not built to take into account, and there has to be leniency and there has to be ways for the law to deal with this. And mm-hmm. the Rob Schneider character is the the way that they help Dread. The movie helps Dread to see that that scenario. Yeah, I found it. Um... Well, yeah, I mean, you said it. It's an experiment in genetic engineering intended to create the perfect judge. DNA project. I don't know. They called it. What was it called? Count from the Council of Judges. I don't know. It was just genetic engineering. Okay. I don't think they really gave it a name. <laughs> but so, so, I mean, do you want to? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, and so talking about this in a dystopic. I think this is kind fashion. of about the about one of the best examples of a truly it's not post apocalyptic necessarily because the you, they don't explain a whole lot about why the outside is uninhabitable but 
you you kind of get the gist that it, oh that's right because we have the we have the outside yeah you have the yeah, outside you kind of get the, the gist though that it was more just we used up the planet right like it, it was scorched and and unusable uninhabitable well, so yeah now and now so we now, throw a wall around exactly the, you, you to throw keep... a wall around it and now you've got this semi inhabitable it's arguable whether it's actually uh, humanly inhabitable it's a way or not. to keep the garbage out right. or yeah or in or in um, yeah. So it's a lot of garbage, you know, and, and I think, again, the most interesting thing to me is that I think a truly dystopian movie or dystopian novel or dystopian story is exactly that. It's a society that has to take measures that we aren't prepared to do in our day and time. I mean, imagine if our government, you know, with no nothing but one person saying you did this you're guilty here's your punishment we aren't prepared to deal with that but in that society that's what they had to do to maintain order Mm -hmm. would we be prepared to do the same thing if that happened who knows i don't know yeah but that's so to me this is about the ultimate in dystopian stories yeah i mean i i love the i mean i love i love the stories where you have this like you have the old world below on the streets and then you have this new world built up trying to get away from this you know this horrible life and they're trying to get away from this past but then you you still have to deal with it i i love i just love those stories i mean it like fifth of, element yeah i was gonna have, say it kind of it harkens back to fifth element where as you descend deeper or even or even things as far back as like even star wars right like mm-hmm. that you got your city planets like coruscant where the further you go down the more you get into almost even mutants and things like that, where they're they're barely even human, almost subhumans at that point. Mm-hmm. I mean, even even the new dread. I mean, f- did a lot with with that as well, um, like the old world. Uh, now, I mean, so yeah, we, I mean, we saw we saw the new dread, um, dread three D, and uh, we did a little mini cast. Um, I don't know, can we? Can we pull that yeah, up? Yeah, let's. Do we uh, play with here, it for you? let me pull that up really quick, and we'll uh, we'll play that so that you guys can kind of get a feel for. We we gave our impressions before the movie and then after it, just very, so that you could kind of uh, just get a generic. little bit of a feel for it. So very generic <laughs> impressions on what we're gonna. All right, so let's play that. Fighting for order in the chaos. The men and women of the Hall of Justice. Hey everybody, this is Wendell and... I'm Niles. Of the Dystopic Boys. And I guess I don't actually need to be this close to the microphone. But. So uh, we are here standing in line. Yeah, that's right, there's a line for uh, Dread 3D. Dread 3D, of course, we're here in 3D. Uh, yeah, watching this movie uh, in 3D. Obviously, because we wouldn't be in 2D. <laughs> but yeah, we decided we were going to uh, watch this. Uh, that way we can uh, have something to compare to the Judge Dredd that we watched for the first uh, podcast. Now, granted, this movie is not a remake, but a, another chapter of the Dredd series. And we fully expect it to be equally as terrible and awesome as the first one. Except for there's no, You betrayed the law! Or if there is, it won't be said by Sylvester <laughs> Stallone, which means it will be much, much worse. I have that soundbite, by the way, and we're going to use that later. All right, uh, we'll see you guys when uh, so, we get oh, no, out. No, 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 hang on. No. Oh, so wait, okay. so uh, my expectations of this movie are going to be that uh, it will be good in a terrible <laughs> way without right. the awesome that it, awesomeness that is Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> um, how I, about you? I expect something visually amazing. And story-wise, you know, I don't expect anything besides... Well, uh, there's supposed to be a story in a Judge Dredd movie? What? <laughs> well, this one might have a little bit more of a story. I don't know, expectations. I'm, I'm not holding my breath. <laughs> I'm not ex- I mean, you know, the story as far as, you know, the simplest form of, of story, you know. I don't know what I'm talking about. We're just going to go watch this movie. We'll see you guys All when right, we get yeah, we'll, back. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll uh, give our impressions after the movie's over. <laughs> so, uh, uh, see you on the other side. Peace. Over. The sentence is death. Okay, one on our back. Uh, we just watched Dread 3D, actually in 3D. Actually in 3D. And Wendell, 
What are your thoughts? Different. Um, no, I thought it was actually pretty good. Is it what you were expecting? It was not what I was expecting, but I think it, for me, if this had been a movie by itself without a previous one, it actually would have been better. The reason being, as we'll get into in the podcast next week... A well, it's bit not more, a remake, remember? It, well, no, it's not a remake, but I came into this expecting something at least along the same lines as far as kind of the much more, I guess, epic storyline. Like something, that, something that's not just about one block, you know? Judge, oh, more about ju- the... Judge about Dredd, the world. exactly. Judge Dredd went beyond just that one block war that it kind of started out as, and turned into something that was more of a overall the problems with the judges and the problems with the uh, leadership and government in that society. Whereas this definitely leaned more towards just the that that the, one block and yeah, that the one problem. Solitary problem. Uh, actually, the funny thing is, if you see a movie called The Raid. It's like the same story. They took Judge Dredd and put him in the raid. Because what the raid is, is a SWAT team goes into a building, marches up all the floors, and goes and hits the bad guy at the very top. Is that one on our list? It's not on our list because uh, it's not because it's not posted. It's not, a, it's not like a dystopian. It's okay. not a dystopian. So it, it's kind of funny. Judge Dredd in the raid. There you have it. So yeah, I mean, I I love the I love the visuals. It was yeah, actually really yeah, cool. Yeah, the, the but... visuals and the premise and like the overall storyline and everything, I actually thought were pretty good. And and even the the actors and and characters that they got to portray everybody, I thought were really well done. Um, and they got I, betrayed the law in there. Yeah, they got the betrayed the law. Um, but again, I think it was just in comparison to you know what I was what I was used to from Judge Dredd. It was a little more. Um, Toned down, I suppose, as far not not as far as violence or anything, definitely. No, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's like I feel like, yeah, it should have been more of an epic, like judge dread. It, it should have been line. more of a good versus evil and kind of the a tale of society, like Judge Dread was. This one definitely was just more about a good guy, a bad guy, and who wins. Yeah, and we'll talk more about why he had his helmet on for the whole movie, which yes. I actually kind of preferred, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, when we get into the actual first real episode of the podcast, which I uh, should be hitting sometime next week. You uh, betrayed the law! And uh, I suppose we could go ahead and say the uh, the three movies that we watched on that one. It's going to be, uh, let's see, what was the first one we watched? Oh, it was uh, Postman, and then Judge Dredd. And Judge Dredd, the original, and then The Time then of the Wolf. Time of the Wolf. Uh, not many of you may have heard of that one. but Wendell uh, Rant coming to you soon. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> All right, we'll see you guys later if you're still listening. Um, I don't know. Hold on to your pants. We'll <laughs> see you on the other side. All right. So, uh, spoiler alert: <laughs> our third film that we're going to talk about. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, we'll get to that one here in a second. <laughs> um, so it's been a couple days now since we actually watched Dread 3D. Um, how do you think your have your impressions of the comparison between the two changed at all? Well, I mean, what we we're what we were talking about was um, this this whole like we, with Judge Dread, we had this story that. It was it was more on a grandiose scale. It dealt more with like the ideas of the law and the judges and it more the overall involved society, more the city, the society implications. And in this one, I you know, like I said, um, it, it was like taking the story of the raid, which is a great movie by the way. You should see it; just action and awesome. And it took that storyline like this, you know, let's let's go into a building and shoot everybody up and then kill the boss at the end. It was like you sounds know, like a video game, a very video game type of storyline. <laughs> Um. Uh, yeah. I mean, Wendell. I mean, what? Yeah. I mean, I think my impressions are still pretty much what what I said in the the Dreadcast was that, you know, I I th- felt that the story from Judge Dread being much more about the society, I felt that fit better into the dystopian theme. Dread 3D. It was a, a quote unquote good movie. Um. I, I enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed it. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. it was but a movie. I don't think it fit quite as well. I mean, it was definitely a dystopian movie, but it did the the themes were not quite as much about the dystopia. It was more about a story within the dystopia, whereas Judge Dread was a story about that dystopian. Yeah, and it I was, I I tend to I tend to like the stories that are are dealing with the dystopian more. Yeah, I mean this this was a very like excuse me, the, the fight the boss type of Yeah, it line. was it was the you know, we won't spoil this one, but it was 
good guy versus bad guy. Oh, Who right. wins? This, yeah, this one's yeah, recently th- th- out th- theaters. This one's still spoilers, out of the theater, so yeah. no spoiler well, alert on this one. But yeah, again, good guy, bad guy, somebody yeah. wins. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I liked I liked how they kind of portrayed you know the people in the community, but I mean, they were really background still. To exactly. Yeah, they else. were backgrounds there for purposes of that good guy versus bad guy story. Now, I mean, if I had read more of the comics, I'd probably know which one maybe portrayed Dread better. Um, but one, I mean, one thing I want to talk about is he had it. Well, in in the movie, well, he has his helmet on at least more than Judge Dread did. True. Uh, Sylvester Sloan, he's like. Screw this helmet! I'm taking That's true. it off. In, in Judge Dredd, it was probably off in the first what ten or fifteen minutes of the movie. That um, as soon as they got out of their kind of first yeah, he gets battle, in, he's get, he gets pulled into timeout and then uh, he takes <laughs> yeah. his helmet off for the whole time. <laughs> but um, I, I I feel like I feel like there's more dread to have his helmet on. I think that's I think that's one of the reasons I I missed dread in the original one was oh, it was just Stallone. It almost de- uh, what's that word dehumanized him a little bit more by not having his helmet on. So then when that, if, if, maybe Judge if he Dredd, kept his helmet on longer, if he would have kept his helmet on through the first half of the movie and only started to take it off towards the end, when that kind of emotional connection started to try to happen, maybe it would have been more of a large enough difference between the two for you to feel that. Yeah. Stallone was, um, I'm on uh Stallone's view of the film. It was 13 years after Judge Dredd was li- released. Um, Stallone said something in regards to, um, uh, uh, it seemed like a lot of fans had a problem with Dredd removing his helmet because he never does in the comic books. Uh, so, well, there you go. And, of course, John Wagner, the creator of the comic, uh, said in an interview with Empire, like, the story had nothing to do with Judge Dredd. Judge Dredd wasn't really Judge Dredd. So even the, the, crea- even the original writer of the comic yeah, I mean, didn't uh, feel well, that Judge you know, Dredd the movie according was, to a Wikipedia, good, at least. was a good uh, portrayal. Hey, Wikipedia? Anything on Wikipedia? Is and true? you know that that might be. I mean, the big reason might be maybe because he took his helmet off. It's like all of a sudden he, you know, didn't he wasn't Judge Dredd at that point. Yeah. I mean, there was a reason the creator of the comic never took his helmet off. Is that your phone? No, it was the the computer. I was Ignore. Just playing some Ignore. Back, background music. Um. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I I think that uh, I think we pretty much wrapped up for Judge Dredd. Yeah. Do we want to? Do we want to move on? Yeah, I think we should probably should. Um, <laughs> all right, so <laughs> we come back to yeah, uh, come back to next we feel movie. Like it. All right, um, as by our mystery uh, mystery recordings. <laughs> yeah, a little a little spoiler. Um, let's go into. Well, I'll have the recording do it for you. Okay. <laughs> Time of the wolf. Let them to loop. When Anna and her family arrive at their holiday home, they find it occupied by strangers. This confrontation is just the beginning of a painful learning process. Directed by Michael Haneke, starring Isabel Huppert, Anas de Mestier, and Beatrice Daly. Huppert. All right, <laughs> Time of the Wolf. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that pretty much nobody that I know has ever heard of this movie. I didn't hear about it. Or, I, okay, okay, finally, you can go ahead and call this one a film. Finally, I'm not that much of a nerd. No, no, I'm saying oh, you can finally you oh, can yeah, call yeah. this one a no, film. Yeah. This, is definitely a, yeah. this is definitely a film. This is almost approaching art, art film a little bit. Um, yeah, if you want to call it that. Well, in terms in terms of its um, in terms of its stretching, the ideas of what you what you know films to be or movies or whatever, it kind of stretches your limitations of, oh wow, this is actually accepted or this is actually like a movie. Um, so, Michael Hennessy, director, uh, he's done. A, I mean, he's done a lot of films. Uh, he did Funny Games with Naomi Watts. Um, it was a couple of years ago. I actually didn't see it, but it was it was very violent. But I, actually, this film is said to be one of his worst. Lucky for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lucky. We'll call it that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can't find... I didn't pull up any article here to actually read exactly why. Um, but I think it had to do with just some of his story elements. But for Henneke, um Trademarks are kind of 
he has these he has a lot of the like these short outbursts of violence um extremely long takes uh uses no film score i don't know if, i'm sure funny games yeah he's shaking your head over there <laughs> get into soundtracks more later um i don't know if uh funny games had a soundtrack or not um he usually uh, uses news a lot. Um, he uses George a lot uh, for character names. I don't That's know. He likes he odd. likes George. I, if, I love yeah. these facts. Um, female characters like Anna, Anne. He likes those names as the well. The A names. <laughs> yeah, and um, he 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 tends to he tends to focus on psychotic youth a little bit, like the rebel yeah, of youth. Yeah. He tends to do that. Like funny games. Funny games was about. Um, Two kids, I think it was two kids, that come to this house and torture this family. Wow! And uh, I mean, that's so I mean, that up. gives you, yeah, it gives you an idea of this this, this director um, well, a little I mean, bit. And and he likes that, to... that kind of carried over into Time of the Wolf, where you have that the um, the main kid who didn't want to, you know, kind of the loner character, right? And he was willing to animals and do all kinds of things to not get caught and to to be by himself oh yeah that kid yeah that kid yeah that kid uh, I and that was that was the one reason I, I think I wanted I wanted those two characters it was the the daughter um, the daughter and the uh, the kind of the what was the, the lone the lone rambler what was her um, name was it Lise I can't remember yeah I don't remember it was in subtitles yeah, so yeah, a little bit of background about this movie. It was it is a French film that was in French and we watched it with subtitles. There is no score. The so loop. there is no music to it. Um it basically it follows a family that uh you know, they're going to their summer cabin or whatever it is and they that something had happened that they were trying to escape and they never really get into that, which again, like we talked about with regards to Postman, we don't have any problems with that. Um, where it kind of fell apart for me a little bit was the way that the director chose to make you feel nothing. Um, the, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the idea that we, we talked about this a little bit before the idea that we think that the character, the director was trying to get across was that in a true scenario of survival, there isn't any quick fix there isn't anything but the now there's nothing there there's no hope there's no there's no emotion it's just it turns into this numbness that is just the here and the now and that's it and by not putting any music in that that was definitely portrayed but and this is kind of getting into my rant just a little bit it's by by choosing to do it in that way the, the way that the director did it was jumping around right he it's there's no clear yeah, bit, there's yeah. no clear cut story there's no clear cut um beginning middle and resolution it's it's just completely uh, to me meaningless like there there's these meaningless moments where they just sit there like looking at a room full of sleeping people for 25 seconds i want to i want to hear i want to hear you just let go here in just a second but uh i mean to re- to respond to that, um, it's it's one of the, it's one of those things where I feel like um, Henneke was like, I the way the way he tends to work, I believe, is he likes to try to put you in the situation and tries to make you um, like the reason you know there's no soundtrack or the reason he takes really long takes is I I, I feel like he really wants to use the film as a way to make you feel. You know the emotion of being in this room with all these sleeping people for forever. It seems because I mean, for what else are you gonna long. do? <laughs> I mean, he's he's using this film. Um, I, I thought it was, it's it's an interesting um, quote. Uh, like it says, pornography. It seems to me is no different from war films or propaganda films in that it tries to make the visceral, horrific, or transge- transgressive elements of life consumable consumable so it's trying to take something that is beyond hu- beyond the capability for a sane human being to experience and still stay sane aka you know in this case yeah. of like war you know war is something that that as there's a reason that we have 
post-traumatic stress syndrome, right? That That's something that is not meant for humans to deal with in a normal fashion. But he's and still... And he's trying to take that and keep that, but make it something that we can experience. Yeah, I, 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 he, he tends to take that to an extreme uh, most of the times. Like, I, mean, I, I believe he really killed that horse in there yeah and i didn't realize that at the time and that 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 bothered me i i'm well yeah. you know the the whole like um you know uh, i've definitely experienced a couple of those moments in my film knowing history. <laughs> knowing that a film was made in the united states where there are protections against you know animal cruelty and things like that and then watching something like this and then at the end of the movie reading reviews and realizing that this was made in France, and that this was made where those protections don't exist, and well, the fact you, know, you don't see the it was probably, no animals were harmed in the making of this film. At it the was end of probably the, just easier for them to kill a horse rather than go through try to make a fake one. Try to make a fake one that looks real. Yeah, I mean it. It sucks. Well, I, I think but. I think I think it has to do with this type of filmmaking too. It's like try to get the cast to react a certain way, or I mean, I mean there's there's stories of how directors make characters make uh actors feel a certain way and you kind of you hear about some of these stories and you're like uh that's really happening i mean yeah there's they yeah. there's some people that go to really extremes and you don't necessarily hear about till the like the movie's been 10 years old or something like that but um uh yeah where were we at <laughs> Well, okay. <laughs> so, so, and it, I mean, let, let's let's go talk about um, how it fits into the realm of. I guess it's I guess it's post apocalyptic. It, it's it's definitely a post apocalyptic. It's 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 not dystopian, right? Because we don't have any sense that there is an oppressive anything, right? There's no mm-hmm. there's no sense that there's any type of a, a, a government or aliens or anything holding them down. It, it, all we get is this sense that something happened somewhere that everyone's trying to escape mm-hmm. that's all we know yeah. so it could be dystopian it could be post-apocalyptic it could be a natural disaster we have absolutely no way of knowing and and that's fine um i i definitely think this one fits into the genre at the very loosest of the of, of the term you know lucius fox what you said Lucius. Lu- less, I see. I'm, I'm just scratching myself. No, now. I have no idea. <laughs> Lucius what you're Fox, talking. Dark Knight. Sorry. Anyway. Oh, yeah. See, I still haven't seen that. Are you talking about the new one? Uh, yeah, I'm talking yeah, about the new one. I still haven't seen that. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's in. He's in the last one with the Joker. Uh, yeah, it's Dark been Knight. a while. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, shame. shame. Back to shame. a. I know. I know. We need. We need <laughs> to go see it. Um, okay. Anyway, back to a bad movie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no. So I, I. I think that it. It does fit into the genre, but only within the loosest terms. Um, you know, it's it's not a shining example of a dystopian future or a post-apocalyptic where society's dealing with it. I get what the director was trying to do in making you feel like this is what there is after a disaster. But I don't think you a director has to give you a way to connect. And if you can't connect, then you can't feel. And we talked about there were the two, the two kids. And if, well, if, yeah, that's, if they would that's have, a story I wish they kind they of explored more. If they would built on that, make a central character. Give, give it a reason. Give the story, give the movie a reason for existing. Mm-hmm. Give it you know, a main character that goes through something. The, the most we got insight was when the girl was writing to her uh, dead father. Yeah, and she's narrating. And she's narrating. And that's where we start to get a little bit of insight into the character. And by getting that insight of the character, you start to feel for that character. Everything else, all you see is from the outside looking in. And without anything to give you that sense of what is going on, it's hard to feel. And then the lack of music. <laughs> we were talking about this earlier. That, yes, I understand that humans do not have a soundtrack as you're walking around, although it would be kind of cool sometimes. But at the same time, uh, you know, we talked about it earlier that it's like a camera, right? A camera trying to capture a picture outside. Camera can only capture so many different levels of brightness. Mm -hmm. And you as the photographer have to take that into your dark room or light room or computer, whatever you're using, and you have to manipulate it to make it look like what you saw, not what the camera saw. Well, I think it's the same thing for movies. It's the same thing where if... If those people are feeling something, well, 
I'm not going to feel the same thing just watching it on a screen 40 feet away. A director has to use all of the tools at their disposable, disposable, at their disposal to make me, the viewer, feel what those characters were feeling. Music is one of those tools. And by not putting any music in there and not having any type of an, anta an antagonist, not having any type of a cohesive storyline from beginning to end, it makes it very difficult for me as the viewer to actually feel anything about the story, good or bad. Yeah. Well, I mean, I was, you know, we're talking about how soundtracks are sort of this artificial, quote unquote, way of creating this emotion that you yeah. don't get through this 2D. I mean, it, it, films are really this 2D experience. You have this flat screen and you're sitting there in this theater and you're looking at, well, basically a bunch of pictures strung together. So, I mean, you're getting the same experience as if you were looking at photos. Yeah. So, I mean, the soundtrack is this artificial way of putting you in the situation and kind of forcing yourself to feel this emotion that they want you to feel. Um, and, yeah, by not putting a soundtrack in there, you're, you're, you're sort of not getting you're not getting exactly that emotion. I, I believe there are, I mean, I've watched films that don't necessarily have a soundtrack and like uh, really children, men, if you go back and watch children, men, there wasn't a lot of, I mean, it was hidden. There it, was, it was, there more was soundtrack. There. It was more atmospheric music. And I, so maybe it I was think, a radio playing some music or something like that. Like there was at least, there was still, I feel music. like there was more. There was more of an environment, and yeah. I, I mean, in the time of the wolf, it, I mean, in this the scenario they're in, it's very quiet anyway. Yeah, they're in so, uh, I mean, like rural France, I believe. Yeah, I mean, you're. Yeah. I mean, it's. I and I think I think that's part of the. Well, this is the quote unquote sound. This, I mean, the definition of a soundtrack isn't necessarily music. Like, um, I mean, the soundtrack is, you know. The atmosphere, the the sounds that are happening around you, and you know where they were at, it was quiet. So I mean that I think that's part of the reason Henneke chose not to put a soundtrack in there because what are the characters experiencing? Oh, that's fine. He's allowed to do. Oh make yeah, that I know. That doesn't <laughs> yeah. mean it's right. <laughs> just because just because that's the decision he makes does not mean that it's going to actually make me as the audience connect with it. I my opinion is that by doing that. Fine. Maybe the entire purpose that he was trying to get out of it was that he didn't want the viewers to connect. It seems like a kind of a, you know, bass backwards, so to speak, a way of getting your viewer to feel anything about your movie is by purposefully making them not feel anything about your movie. But, you know, well, considering the content of it, maybe it's a good thing that we weren't too attached. That's very true. That's <laughs> very very true. But Probably I really, I thing. really wanted this story with the the daughter and the the lone kid out there yeah that, i really wanted that that story would have tied a lot that was the only together. thing that was whole, i i think holding it together and then the boy at the end i i never got anything from him to begin with so at the end it didn't really yeah not to i i, I won't really spoil i won't spoil the end to this film because you know if, if you really want to watch it uh, you know it's, it's kind of an interesting ending i'll just give um, you a hint you don't <laughs> but i mean henneke also did a lot of stage work so, I mean, he's, you know, maybe he's coming at it from a play perspective. Well, that's a problem, though. If you try to, that's, that's like saying, if you, detr if you try to take one medium's uh, contrivances, if you try to take what works in one medium and make it work in another medium, it does not necessarily work. Mm -hmm. You have to use what each medium is good at. That's like, you know, it, there's a reason that paintings work in some instances, and photographs work in other instances because there are not everything you can paint and not everything you can take a picture of. No. All right. anyway. And that was a Wendell rant. <laughs> <laughs> that was loud. All right. Um, okay, so... Uh, I mean, so, let's, we, I mean, we were talking about no soundtracks. Yes. I mean, so, that one did not have a soundtrack. So for going, reasons we've already talked about, going back to the other two movies, they did have soundtracks. Is um, there? Is, I mean, is there a favorite? You should play a favorite track of yours from. We'll the play Postman. just a small track <laughs> here um, to get us from, in the mood for soundtrack love. From Postman, that's awkward. Um, from the Postman, this is this. Uh, I'm just gonna play a portion of it. This is called 
the restored United States. And I think this song actually gives a good example of kind of overall what the music and what the feel of this movie was. It was Sorry, very, is this Postman? Yeah, this is for the Postman. So uh, just like back in the 80s, Top Gun was claimed to be like a recruiting video for the Navy. Well, I think this almost makes it feel like this movie was a recruiting video for the Postal Service, as weird as though that sounds. And just because I have to say Top Gun, Tony Scott, rest in peace. Yeah. I miss you. All right, so this is called The Restored United States, and we'll just play just uh, probably 20 or 30 seconds of it. It's a good thing we're in mono. Yeah. I can turn it up a little bit. This is Howard. This is Howard. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm getting confused. Howard's a hard one to pin down because he's done so many genres. I mean, he's like, he's everywhere. Okay, so, yeah, you can, you can kind of, yeah, you'll have to excuse the, uh, Windows <laughs> Windows beeping in the background. Um, you can kind of see how that sound has a very you don't get a lot of that snare drum, that kind of almost marching beat it's snare. It's the marching drum. it's the marching yeah, Exactly. Snare like drum. like that has a very it gives it a very patriotic feel and then you also have a, at the beginning of the song you have a few choral elements where you've got kind of uh Sorry, light really, uh, yeah. <laughs> you've got kind of like a, a, a choir in the background and then you move from that into much more powerful brass instruments and stuff so that that's very um, indicative of what the rest of the soundtrack is like um, it's got slow songs it's got faster songs but that that's kind of an, a good overall view of what the soundtrack sounds like I, I really I really actually like this soundtrack I think James Howard's a really good composer I also actually like Judge Dredd um, the it definitely has much more of a really campy, really over the top '80s. Well, here we are making a comic book film. Let's make a exactly you know, a very, like yeah. Let's make a very upbeat, campy comic book. Yeah, it it, it was good though. Um, Alan Silvestri, he's done quite a few other things, and like GI Joe recently. I mean, he does a lot of the like comic book. And in, right in reading some things as we were preparing for this, like this is Judge Dredd is one of the movies that he's pretty well known for um, as far as his soundtrack work goes. So no, I um. And he was actually he was like one of the last of like four to actually finally get the part. Oh or, yeah, uh, yeah. Because there was a couple people, and then they went on to something else. Or the, Judge Dredd was very. Um, there was a lot of things that went weirdly awry on That's set. That's true. <laughs> no. Of the two, I would say I probably overall enjoyed the Postman soundtrack more. Um, I think it, I really like that kind of... Uh, like Howard stuff as opposed to Sylvester. Yeah, yeah, I definitely think I, I preferred the Howard stuff a, a little bit more than the Sylvester. But uh, no, overall, I really enjoyed both soundtracks. Um, I would love to have seen what kind of something they would have put in Time of the Wolf. Like, I should, what I should, could that movie... Hey, there you go. I there, should go, I should go back and add a soundtrack to the film Niles, just to see if... Go back, add a soundtrack to Time of the Wolf, and see if it makes it any better. All right. I don't know if I liked the movie enough to actually go back and... <laughs> actually put that much put effort a, into yeah, it? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. But those are, right. I mean, there's a couple good mo- moments in it, but I don't... Yeah. I don't like the characters enough, so... Um, Oh, uh, hey, we didn't do this at the beginning, uh, but I kind of wanted to do, talk about some news that's sort of going on okay. in the uh, dystopian world. Uh, so, I mean, well, oh, we ha- I, I don't want to spoil what we're watching next yet. Okay. Uh, well, okay, but, then why don't we go ahead and talk about what we're going to be wait, watching uh, next okay. first, and then we Should can talk we? about your news. Okay. All right, so um, the way that we're kind of working out what we're choosing is... Niles and I went through the Wikipedia list of dystopian films, movies. Granted, there are a lot more films out there, so please tell us if we missed a really good one. Yeah. Um, and actually, what we should do is we'll post up the list on the website. Um, that way people can kind of take a look and see if there's anything we missed or uh, well, that's a good any, idea, anything Wendell. like that. Um, so we went through, 
we went through and chose out all of the movies that we actually want to see. And then we put those in one list and put everything else in a second list. At least based on names that we recognized or films that we've been wanting to seen see for before, a while. Seen before, haven't seen before, but recognize that type of thing. And then we went through and we are randomly choosing for each podcast two movies that are from our list that we do want to see. And then we are randomly selecting one movie from the list that we have no idea. Now, granted, I mean, after doing this first cast, uh, we might cut it down to two movies because, uh, I mean... Turns out we have a lot more to talk about this stuff than we thought. Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> the next... Well, yeah, well, you'll, you'll find out. We, I have a lot to talk about this next... Oh, well, that's coming up in the news. So, so let's, uh, let's bring up the randomizer, huh? All right. TikTok. All right, so the next movies we're going to watch are... Robocop, oh. the first one. Oh, yeah. And bodies um, exploding. This one's not exactly random. Um, <laughs> this next one was uh, we, we also decided that as dystopian movies are coming out in theaters, uh, we decided we would throw those into the mix as well. That's why we saw Dread. Which 3D. is why we saw Dread 3D. And coming out next weekend is Looper. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. Indeed. Um, Holy crap. So, okay, so before Niles goes all fangirl on us, uh, oh the other God. one that we may be throwing in there as well, uh, we're not sure yet, is the, the one that we've never heard of before. It's called Revenger's Tragedy. Um, so those... Oh, what's the guy's... What's the, what's the lead role's name? You, you had him... You had him pinned. Oh, I did have him pinned. You had him pinned. Um, and I can't remember. And Niles, why don't you go ahead and start gushing about Looper while I look that up? <laughs> uh, so... I, I don't know. I've been hearing a lot of things about Looper just like being like this year's Drive. If you if you haven't seen Drive, it's one of my favorite films from this last year with Ryan Gosling. Gosling. Um, but I, I hear it's even better than that. But it's just I don't know the whole the whole stuff I'm seeing about time travel and uh, you know assassination through time. Ah, it's just it looks brilliant. Plus, I mean the makeup that they're doing on it. And the soundtrack. I mean, we can go talking about the sound. Well, I want to talk about the soundtrack till next. We Let's talk just about say it. that 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 there are some preview, really there unique. are some preview videos out there of um, the composer and how he made the soundtrack for Looper, and he used a lot of like atmospheric sounds and like just environments slamming car doors and then pitch shifting them, and it it, it really sounds amazing. So I'd recommend go out, go out there if you're interested in it and uh, take a listen to some of the that stuff that's on there. We'll try to get that stuff into the show notes for you. And good news, everyone. They're, uh, they're remaking. Well, they're remaking a lot of films recently. Um, one of which is since you've revealed that we're watching RoboCop, they're actually, re well, I don't know if they're remaking, but they are doing another RoboCop. Seriously. Okay. So is it going to be like RoboCop four? Uh, or I, is it I just like RoboCop 1.1? I don't actually know that, but I actually have the, uh, the image here. Look at look at his suit. Looks like a you know what? It looks like uh, Spawn. We're almost know, looking at like a GI Joe sort of. It looks of. like the the evil Spider Man. The I, all the comic book fans out yeah, there. Yeah, but if you notice one thing, his mouth is still revealed. Revealed. Yeah. I mean, you can pull up this image um, on the, the web. Murphy. Just look Officer it up. Murphy. Yeah. Um, I mean, is it Murphy? Is it Murphy? Ooh, I don't know. I haven't I haven't done enough research to know, but um, we'll leave that for later. Um, and then also. Um, we're also fans of the morning stream by Scott Johnson. Oh yeah, hi Scott. But uh, he had he had mentioned uh, Tom Hardy because he was watching a film called The Warrior, which I need to see, which is awesome. I hear. Um, but he's actually remaking Mad Max or another. Let's say it might be another story. Of kind of the another Mad story Max. set in that universe. Yeah. Which well, we I, will have to make sure that when that one is aimed at coming out, that we. You know, kind of watch that one in. I, yeah, I believe we we should we need to watch that one probably before. See, this. I've never seen. Now, Mad granted, Max. this is probably going to come out in 2013, so I think we have That's some true. time. Yeah, we got some. Time. You haven't seen it. I have never seen the original. I'm really trying to remember if I've actually seen like the whole thing, like, and there's a couple of them. There, I think there's like three of them. There's like I have three. No I can't remember. But all right, so um, going back good to news, the good news, good news, remakes. Going back to the Revengers tragedy, um, the you're right. I did. I had pegged the actor. Um, his name is Christopher Eccleston. 
Oh, and right. he was the first Doctor Who of the remade Doctors, um, oh, starting right. in, I believe, his early 2000s by the BBC. Doctor Who. So he was uh, the Doctor for one season, and I really enjoyed him in Doctor Who. And was it so, just one season? Yeah, he was only he the, was the first. He was the first Doctor, and then uh, they moved from him to David Tennant was the Doctor for four or five seasons. I really enjoyed David Tennant as well, but Chris, Christopher Eccleston get, did a really good job in that role. And uh, so I'm actually really looking forward to... Uh, watching this I don't know if it'll be a film or a movie but uh whatever it is um just to kind of see him because I haven't seen him in anything else other than just that uh the Doctor Who season so it'll, it'll be really interesting to to watch oh man what was he what jeez oh, I'm trying to remember what he was in recently that I really like I I've actually really liked him whenever I've seen him let's see he's, he's done a couple of, been do you have in, yeah I've got him pulled up here um uh, shadow line G.I. Joe um, ah yes, um, he was the. He was on Heroes actually, he the, the TV show for a, for uh, several episodes. Um, Doctor Who. That was that back in two thousand and five. He was on Doctor Who. Um, he was twenty eight days later. <gasps> That's right. Apparently. Oh, and that was actually, actually the same year as Revengers Tragedy, both in two thousand two. Oh, he was in a dystopian world at that point. Apparently. Because 28 days later. And then he was in a movie or a mini series it. by Stephen Baxter called, or he was Stephen Baxter called The Second Coming. Well, I'm sure and he's. Bible Mysteries. I'm sure weird. he's all over BBC. Yeah, I'm sure. So. Um, okay, so those are going to be the movies that, uh, again, we may not end up getting to all three for the next episode, but uh, we'll kind of see where. Yeah, because I want to talk about. Yeah, now I have a feeling I'm going to. Now this is going to have a half an hour crap of out of Looper. About Looper. Just because, so, um, I mean. I, I I have a feeling it's going to be one of these movies that just falls into the cult classic, just yeah, just movies well, to watch it, in the future. You know, if you look at uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt and what he did in Inception, you know, I think we've started to kind of see what he can do in some of those types of movies and those kind of not kind of science fiction, but kind of s- weird science fiction. But he he definitely he definitely gets pinned for these these roles that kind of. They they're they're kind of surreal in the sense that yeah he, he gets pulled in these worlds of like it's a little it's a little different from our own you have to I kind mean, of suspend a little bit of disbelief suspend uh, your kind of sense of reality a little bit to, to yeah I mean accept even, it as a world I mean he's he's playing in some like recent noir film um uh called a brick um it's it's done in a noir style or like fifty days of summer uh. There's like musicals in there. I mean, even he he does a lot of roles, but he he does these roles that kind of pull you out of the generic type of. I mean, because he can be typecast as just as regular, oh like, yeah, comic pretty boy, but he tends to get these awesome roles. I I'm I'm really kind of jealous. I have kind of a sort of a man crush on him. At least <laughs> at least his his uh his palette of stuff that he's been doing. So. All right. Well, I think that's going to about wrap it up. Niles, anything else you want to uh, kind of talk about before we start wrapping things up for this episode? Um, I think I'm I think I'm good. All right. Well, we want to make sure that you guys uh, feel free to uh, get a hold of us if you feel uh, like you'd like to leave us some feedback or have suggestions, anything like that. You can go to dystopicradio.com. That's where you can find all of the show notes, episodes, links to subscribe on iTunes as well as the RSS feed. You can find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash dystopic radio. Oh, yeah. You can also give us a call and leave us a voicemail at 206-414-9309. Really? You can can uh, leave, yeah, exactly. They can call us and leave us a voicemail. You can also just send us an email with an MP3 file attached if you'd like. Uh, That'd be feedback at dystopicradio.com. And uh, all of the other links to reach us are available up on the website at dystopicradio.com. Oh, my. <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, I just uh, been, I just been searching through the soundboard like, I, I don't know what to push. I'm too yeah, slow. There's too many options. <laughs> I'm too slow. All right. Well, um, I hope you guys all enjoyed the episode. Uh, and like I said, we would welcome your feedback. We're new to this and we realize that and we want to make it as good as we can, as good as we can, as well as we can, as well as we can. So uh, we welcome your feedback. So uh, please the goodest, let us the know. goodest to this podcast. All right. Well, well, if you are still listening out there and you're one of the survivors with us, um, yeah, live well. And I hope you're eating because, man, you're probably starving right now. And we'll see you guys on the other side. For anyone still out there, this is the Dystopic Radio Network. You're listening to the Dystopic Voice. 
used to be a postman for every street in America. They wore uniforms and hats, just like this one. Getting a letter made you feel like you were part of something bigger than yourself. I don't think we ever really understood what they meant to us until they were gone.